We continue our series of Bible studies on biblical anthropology. And when one of the preachers was giving lectures to his students, he was telling them how to preach on certain subjects. He said, when you preach on heaven and paradise, you need to make sure that your faces are shining you know, with happiness and delight and joy because you are preaching about a wonderful place. But when you preach about hell, he said, <laughs> you can remain as, as you are. <laughs> you don't need to change anything. So I'm going to preach a sermon by God's grace and you decide what was the topic. Okay? The title for the presentation is The Destination. Destination. By the way, that rule applies not only to preachers. So let's go to our first scripture and our first text is found in Luke chapter 24 and verse 43. Luke 24, verse 43. I'm so delighted to open the Word of God. I look forward each Sabbath to worship with you, to open the Scripture, and to study the Word of God. Let's go to Luke 23 and verse, 20, uh, verse 43. And Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. What a promise. What a promise from our Savior. Right there on the cross, he makes a very personal promise to the thief that was crucified next to him. The promise about paradise, the assurance that he will be in paradise. And the good news of the gospel is that the cross of Christ is there, that you and I, every one of us, could be there. Isn't that the good news? So we will be studying about paradise. What did he promise to the thief? What is it? Where is it? who is there and how to get there and what can we learn from the scripture about paradise. Just in, as a review, I want to just repeat what we've studied so far. We were talking about holistic nature of, um, of the creation of human being. When God created us, he created a living soul, upbeat, full of strength and wisdom, created in the image of God. Male and female, both of them were created in the image of God. We've studied that in ancient pagan traditions, because of rejecting the Creator, people believed in immortality of the spirits. Plato formulated the theory about two separate nat natures, soul as entity that can become personal, separate from the body with feelings and emotions, and the body on the other hand was presented as the prison of the soul. So slowly Platonic teachings crept into the Christian worldview and became dominant teachings in Christianity even today about dualistic nature of human being. Millions of Christians today believe in immortality of the soul and they find it comforting. However, the same belief is depressing for the Hindu people. If you think about Hindu religion, the immor uh, immortality of the soul is depressing because you have to go through karma, reincarnation, living over and over and over and over again and suffer over and over and over again because you can't die and then eventually you want to be free from karma which is called nirvana in their teaching. So that theory came into the church and... Um, affected a lot of understanding and teachings in Christian world view. Later on, the belief in immortality of the soul brought another side of the coin, another teaching of eternal burning hell, which is 
the place where the soul would go, if the soul does not go to the paradise, then the soul would have to be somewhere because it can die. So eternally burning hell was invented as a theory eventually to accommodate that. And so we'll be studying about that for the, on the next weekend, uh, next Sabbath, so I'll prepare my face for the, for the next, <laughs> next meeting. But I hope I'm doing um, okay presenting today the, the topic of paradise, uh, because God have predestined all people uh, to be saved in Jesus Christ. He wanted us to be saved. Jesus died on the cross, it says, so whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So, um, yeah, we long for heaven. Even when we don't realize that there is a deep-seated need in all of us for something better. Regardless of all the theories that we mentioned, we long for something better. We were created for something better. My soul thirsts for God, David says, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So what is this destination? What is the paradise that the Bible is talking about? And what did Christ promise to the thief on the cross? Well, let's begin with, with a word study. And uh, we'll look at, at the word paradise as it is used in the Bible. In the New Testament, it is used three times. In the Old Testament, it is used 42 times. And so the first reference we find in the Old Testament is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 8. Let's look. Let's read together. Uh, well, um, if you'd like. The Lord God planted a garden. And this is the word. In original, it's gan, G-A-N, not G-U-N. G-A-N in English transliteration from Hebrew, word gan means paradise translated as garden or paradise in the scripture. The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put a man whom he formed. And verse 9 says, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. There, there you have it. That's again the same word, Gan, is used. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And again, the word Gan in original is used to describe paradise or the garden. So what are we learning so far? God planted a paradise. What do we learn about this paradise? He placed his creation, Adam and Eve, in paradise, in the garden. There was a tree of life, it says, in the midst of the garden. And the garden needed to be watered. There was a river river to, to water in the garden. Scripture tells us that this paradise was a place created by God. And by the way, the word Eden that we read in the previous verse, do you know what the word Eden means? Eden means delight, happiness, joy. So it was the garden of happiness, the garden of delight, the garden of joy. That's what God designed for you and me in the very beginning. So we are learning about paradise as God designed it in the very beginning. Now when we come to the New Testament, I mentioned that there are three um, times when the word paradise is used in the New Testament. The word in Greek is paradisos. Paradisos is taken from ancient um, Syria, uh, and it means a walled garden or garden surrounded with walls. See, in Syria, in ancient Syria, in the middle of the wilderness, when they wanted to have a garden, they had walls around the garden, kind of to protect it. And the Garden of Eden also had some, uh, some walls because there were gates we, we know about uh, from the Bible because God placed an angel at the gate of the garden. So, uh, paradisos in Greek is the word that we find in the New Testament describing again a place to live, um, a garden or a park, if you will. So Adam and Eve, they lost their happiness. They lost the garden of happiness. But good news of the Bible that we find is that God is going to restore 
that lost paradise. He's planning to restore his family to the same Garden of Eden. Eden is going to be restored. So let's look up one of the New Testament places where the word paradise is used in Revelation 2.7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Paradise, again, meaning a garden of God, or place where God would have his redeemed dwell, is mentioned here in Revelation chapter 2. And it will be returned back to earth. It will be a special place because there will be a tree of life, it says. So, where is paradise now? In heaven? That's right. How do we know? If you go to Revelation 22.2, if you are taking notes and you uh, jot down Revelation 22.2, it talks that in the middle of the city there is a tree of life. So if the tree of life is in the middle of the garden and it's in the middle of the city, so where is the paradise right now? In the city. What city? New Jerusalem. Where is New Jerusalem now? How do we know? Revelation 21. Let's go with me to Revelation 21 and read this beautiful promise. Revelation chapter 21. Verses 1 and 2. Now I saw, John is writing, I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. So where is New Jerusalem now? It's in heaven. It will be coming down to this earth, just as it was described in the book of Revelation. So paradise, the garden of God, the tree of life, is placed in the very center of the New Jerusalem, like it says in the Bible. So it is in heaven now. And it is the destination of the redeemed. After a thousand years, it comes down, and that's the place where Jesus is preparing a place for you and me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Verses 2, 3, and 4, Paul is sharing that he saw in a vision the same paradise of God. This is the third instance. So, three instances in the New Testament. One we mentioned on the cross, Jesus mentions paradise. Place number two, Revelation 2, 7, it's mentioned paradise. And this is in Pauline writings in 2 Corinthians, he mentions paradise. And I know such a man, he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So Paul is describing an experience, and most of the theologians, they come to the conclusion that he is talking about himself. He's talking about himself, that at a certain time, he had the privilege to see paradise. Let me ask you a question. Is it described like an after-death experience or while he was alive? Because some people say that when you die, you go out of your body and you travel. But Paul, referring to his experience, first of all, he doesn't know where, whether he was in the body or out of the body. He is not making a statement in that regard. But the fact is clear that he was still alive when this happened. What happened? He had a vision, just like John the Revelator was taken in the Spirit and he was shown the things around the throne of God. In the same way, Paul had a vision that he says, I had the privilege to, I was caught up into paradise, place that Jesus prepared for those who love him. That's you and me. Am I correct? Amen. So, um, question, if there is a place... If there is a garden, if, if there is a paradise, next question would be, uh, are there people in it? What does the Bible say? Are there people 
um, right now in paradise. Other people that already reached the destination and they are already there. What does the Bible say? The Bible says yes. Uh, yes, there are people there. Now let's look at, at those who are there. Bible mentions Enoch who walked with God. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. And he disappeared. What happened to him? God took him. He was translated and, and uh, Hebrews chapter 11 says that he was translated without seeing death. So to get into the paradise, you don't have to die. See, Enoch did not die. He was bodily translated, transported into heaven. That's a very interesting clue. People in paradise are not bodiless spirits. The first person we are learning in paradise, he was with his body taken into the paradise to be in the garden as a living person. Anybody else is populating paradise right now? Elijah, yes. Second King, chapter 2, verse 11. If you're taking notes, it talks about Elijah, that he was taken up in the, in the fiery chariot. Swing low. <laughs> Swing chariot. A question. Was he taken to heaven as a spirit or a ghost or he was taken bodily? Bodily. Are we learning something about paradise? Paradise is a real place. It's a garden. It's a place where we have the tree of life. And it's a place where people are present with their bodies. They're not bodiless spirits. They are present there with their bodies. Now, both Enoch and Elijah were bodily taken to paradise. Anybody else? Who do you recognize in this picture? <laughs> well, somehow disciples were able to recognize that there was Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew chapter 17 talks about it. So Moses appeared with Jesus. Jesus told people of his generation that some of you standing here will not see death, but you will see the glory, the kingdom of God and its glory. And he revealed in miniature the glory of his kingdom when representatives of his kingdom, representatives from paradise itself as their home address, they came to encourage Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 and 3. And Moses is mentioned. That's person that we are studying about. Jesus is demonstrating the glory of his kingdom. Now, I have a question. How did Moses get there? Bible says that he was buried, right? He died. He was buried. But in the book of Genesis it says, but nobody knows where his tomb is. Or his body is. How is that possible? They buried the person, but they don't know where his body is. A New Testament gives us a clue. Now, by the way, this is the picture of the Mount Nebo, where Moses ended his earthly journey. And on the picture, did you try to take a picture of the ocean or the mountains on your camera, on your phone? Probably you tried. Does it look real? No. It doesn't, it doesn't do justice to what you see with your eyes. And uh, when I was approaching Mount Nebo in the bus, we were going up the mountain. It took us over 40 minutes on the bus to get to the top of the mountain. It's a huge mountain. In fact, from that mountain, you can see for like 50 kilometers, and you can see the sparkling dome on the rock of the, of the Jerusalem. You can see in the good weather from the Mount Nebo. And Moses was shown from this mountain, from the top of the mountain, he was shown the promised land. It's a huge mountain. You don't see it on the picture. It looks like a little hill. <laughs> but um, it's a huge mountain. And on the top of the mountain, there is a memorial that stands there. It says that memorial, there is, it's a memorial of Moses. But it's not a tomb of Moses. There is no such a thing as a body of Moses. What happened to him? A New Testament gives us a clue in Jude chapter 1 and verse 9. 
If you go with me to Jude chapter 1 and verse 9, we'll read what the Bible tells us about Moses and his body. Now, the book of Jude is a really small book. So, I hope you can find it. I hope I can find it. All right, it's um, John, the letters of John, and then we come to the book of Jude. Almost all the way back to the Revelation. If you go to the Revelation and go one book backwards, that's the little letter of Jude, epistle of Jude. Okay, so chapter 1 and verse 9. Let's read. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Who is mentioned in this verse? Michael the archangel. Did you know if you read the scripture, throughout the scripture, Michael the archangel is one of the names for Jesus. And when Jesus is mentioned in regards to resurrection, his name is Michael. So every time you read about Michael, there is some connection with the resurrection of the dead. I'll give you a couple examples. One example would be Daniel chapter 12, when it talks that Michael will stand up and many who will be uh, uh, resting in the graves will be raised to life. That's one example. Do you remember one more example about Michael the archangel and the resurrection from the New Testament? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. It talks with a, vo with a shout of God and, and the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ will rise first. That's 1 Thessalonians um, 4, 16 and 17. Again, archangel the Michael is mentioned. So when Michael is mentioned in the Bible, it has to do with resurrecting the dead. And so Michael the archangel was uh, contending with the devil about the body of Moses. Why? Because the Mo Moses would be resurrected. And then he appears on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus as one of the representatives from paradise from heavenly garden, from a place that Jesus is preparing for us. Question, is Moses present there bodily or without a body? Bodily. That's why the contention was not about the spirit or uh, any, anything else, but about his body. So he would be raised from the dead and he would appear as a representative from earth. And do you know why Jesus had those two representatives from the kingdom to come and be with him on that Mount of Transfiguration? Those two people, Moses and Elijah, they represented redeemed of all ages. Because redeemed will have two categories. First category will see Jesus when he comes and will be translated without seeing death. That happened to Elijah. And Moses was a representative of those who would die before Jesus comes, but they would be raised from the dead because of the power of Christ. So in the kingdom of God, there will be two kinds of people, those who have seen death and they were resurrected. And so those two people came to encourage Christ that his mission will not be in vain. There will be trophies. There will be people who will be populating the paradise. And there is a place for you and me in his kingdom. So we mentioned Enoch. We mentioned uh, Elijah. We mentioned Moses. Those are people in the bodily form in the kingdom. Anybody else in the kingdom today? Uh, thank you. <laughs> I have good helpers here. Those who were resurrected when Jesus was here and he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. It says here, and the graves were opened in Matthew 27 and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So how many were resurrected here? We don't know. It was a special resurrection. 
It was a special resurrection that took place. And when Jesus ascended to heaven, it says in Ephesians 4, 8, this is why it says when he ascended on high, talking about Jesus, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. So we talked about Enoch. We talked about Elijah being in heaven. We talked about Moses, and now Scripture says about captives that went with Jesus to heaven. How many? We don't know. Twenty-four elders are mentioned in the book of Revelation as those who are serving around the, the, the uh, throne of God. Now we need to remember that the word elder in the Bible does not mean elderly. Okay. <laughs> The word, the, the, the word, I'm sorry, the word elder in the Bible is, in original, is presbyteros. What does it remind you? Well, in, in Russian language, there is a word presviter, which means elder. And presbyteros, in original, means a minister. They're ministering. It doesn't mean they're old-looking people. <laughs> it says elders ministers around the throne of God. How many are mentioned? 24. We don't know if the number is literal or symbolic. The reason why I say that is because in the Old Testament there were 24 shifts of priests in the sanctuary. Not necessarily 24 priests, but there were 24 shifts and elders uh, not elders, but priests, they were taking, taking turns in serving. So that's the, the connection there with a, you know, with a sanctuary service as those who are serving in the heavenly sanctuary in the presence of God, 24 elders. They are ministers. So those are the people that are mentioned in the Bible. Notice they are all taken there bodily, all taken bodily to be present with the Lord and to serve there. Why is it important for us to study this and understand? When I first came to Spokane, I was, I was talking to different people and I was given like several DVDs with people who have shared their out-of-body experience. And they have traveled to paradise and they have seen spirits of all their relatives and friends being present in paradise and rejoicing and, and they had a special message special message for the family and for, for the friends that was delivered straight from paradise. Now, I don't necessarily want to say that their experience was not authentic. I'm sure they have seen something. But we as Christians should check everything on compare with the Bible. Isn't that true? So if there is a special message coming from a DVD or from a person that traveled and saw the spirits and, uh, and redeemed and everything, and then they have a special message for you because it comes from paradise itself. Isn't that something that we should take seriously? That's the question why we have as Christians to study these topics because based on the Bible, we understand and we see that only people with their bodies, they are present in paradise. And only those that are mentioned in the Bible. How about others? How about other righteous people that have died, served the Lord faithfully, but were not resurrected in special resurrection, were not taken bodily into heaven, but still are resting in the graves? Have they reached their destination or not? Now let's look at a couple examples. For example, the Bible talks about David. David, you know, he, he, was a, he was a sinner like the rest of us, but he repented, and the Lord said, you're a man after my own heart. Is he in heaven now? What does the Bible say? Acts chapter 2, let's look at verses 29 and 34. Acts chapter 2, verses 29, it says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you on the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Now there is a clarification. In verse 34. For David did not ascend into the heavens. Was he righteous? 
Did he, did he love the Lord with all of his heart? Yes, but it says his tomb is here, his body is here, he did not ascend to heaven. What about, what about Daniel? Daniel, who was serving the Lord faithfully, who loved the Lord and his people with all of his heart. Let's look at Daniel. Daniel chapter 20, uh, 12 and verse 13 talks about Daniel and his, um, his uh, location. It says here, But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest, it says about Daniel, and will arise to your inheritance when? At the end of days. Loving the Lord, serving Him faithfully, the Lord Himself tells him, Daniel, you will go to rest. You will rest until the end of days, and then you will come up, and then you will receive your inheritance. How about all the heroes and uh, those people who are heroes of faith mentioned in Hebrews 11, chap chapter 11, and verses... Well, how about all others? John 5, 28 says... All who are in the graves will hear his voice. So it tells us that people don't travel necessarily after death. They remain in the graves, except those people that we mentioned that already were taken by God to be present bodily in the, in the garden or paradise of God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 and 40, it says, All these people, talking about the martyrs of faith, were known for their faith, but none of them received what God has promised. None of them, except those that we are mentioned in the Bible, received what God has promised. God planned to give us something very special, talking about us, you and me, so that we would gain eternal life, how? With them. You see, they are not waiting for us over there. Bible says when Jesus comes at the voice of the archangel and trumpet of God, we will be caught together to meet the Lord in the air. That's when we're going to reach that destination. That destination is not reached right after a person dies. It says here that none of them received because they were looking for the city. They were looking for the real place where they would dwell with the Lord. So you have a question now probably. But how about the promise given to the thief on the cross? Didn't Jesus tell him that today you will be with me in paradise? Wasn't that promise given to him with a certainty that uh, today, not someday, not at the end of days, not at the very end, but today he will be with Jesus in paradise? How do we bring those texts together? The Bible does not contradict itself. It's a word of God. It's the truth. And the Word of God does not contradict itself. So how do we understand that passage? Well, know that the punctuation marks that were added to the Bible in 4th century did not exist when the Bible was first written. Does punctuation matter? If you say, for example, um, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Or you will say, I say to you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. Do you see the change? So if, if punctuation was placed with people who had already idea that people go to heaven right after they die or their spirits go to and they can communicate and things like that, they would place comma in a certain place. But if we want scripture to agree, the comma belongs to where it needs to be. Jesus is talking to the thief on the cross and he tells him that today, when I'm dying for the sins of the whole world, when it doesn't look like I can save anyone, but I can assure you today, you can have that assurance today from me. You don't have to wait, but I can assure you today that you will be with me in paradise. Jesus could not promise that he will be with a thief in paradise the same very day because he wasn't there. How do we know? 
In John 20, 17, when Mary comes to Jesus and she wants to hug, hug him and hold him, what did Jesus told, tell her? In some translations, don't touch me. Other translations, don't detain me. Don't hold me, Mary. And the next phrase says, for I have not ascended to my father yet. So how could he promise the thief to be in paradise the same very day if he was not intending to go there? Obviously, the comma was not in the right place. And if we listen carefully to what thief is asking, thief was not asking Jesus to be in paradise the same day. What did he ask Jesus? Will you remember me when you come in your kingdom? When Jesus comes as a king of kings and lord of lords, when he introduces his kingdom, that's what people believed. You know, when, when Martha and Mary were talking to Jesus about Lazarus, what did, what did they say? We know that he will live on that day, on the last day. So that was the request of the thief. When you come in your kingdom, please remember me. And Jesus assured him. Jesus assured him that he will. He will remember him on that day. Because that's the hope that you and I have. Our only hope is in Jesus. I don't know how you feel, but I often feel like that thief on the cross. Crippled, feeling guilty and weak. All I can ask Jesus, please remember me. Please have mercy on me. And do you know what good news is? That's why he died on the cross, so he would remember you and me. That's the gospel. That's the love of God. There is nothing else in this world like the love of Jesus. That's why he died on the cross, to promise us that paradise, real place for real people with real joy and happiness. We were created holistic. The, the sin affected the whole person. We were redeemed and sanctified as a whole and we will be saved in the kingdom as holistic human beings. Are you longing for heaven today? C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said, most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. Promising things of this world, they never keep their promise. But there is one who promised, who promised that thief on the cross, you will be with me in paradise. It was personal, it was assurance, and that was the true statement of hope and happiness that only Jesus can give. God's plans for you and me are more amazing than we can imagine. His dream for us is beyond our imagination. So now let's wrap it up. What is so special about heaven? Is it the, tr uh, the streets of gold? Streets of gold? One of my friends, he wrote a song that when I'll be in heaven, I don't need a chisel. <laughs> I don't need to walk with a chisel to try to get some piece of pavement or a curb and bring home. <laughs> it's, not, it's not about the streets of gold. What is it that is so special about heaven? What is it? Psalm 30, 73, David says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. So it's not the streets of gold. It's not even the length of life. Because Jesus, when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the Father and the Son that you have sent. What is so special about heaven? Not the streets of gold, not even the tree of life and the length of life. What is it? It is the presence of Jesus. What have I in heaven but you? 
Jesus will be the only true source of true happiness. When I think about that, I try to imagine what it will be like to have Jesus as the source of happiness. And as I was thinking and praying about it, as I was preparing to share with you about paradise, the Lord brought to my attention the story of one pastor in Russia. He is a pastor in Zaoksky Seminary. His name is Alexander Lisichin. Eleven years ago, in his family, they had a boy, little Sasha, that was born with cerebral, cerebral palsy. And here is what Pastor Alexander wrote on his post just last week when Sasha, their little boy, was 11 years old. He had a birthday. He said that with every coming year, we feel more and more love for this boy. It doesn't mean that it becomes easier and easier, but it means that we can see God more and more in this history of our family. We have a lot of thankfulness. We have a lot of love that God gives us every day. He says, at the same time, we have a grandma that stays with us, and, he, and she has Alzheimer's. So, pastor and his wife and two daughters, they feed grandma and they feed little boy, taking care constantly, 24-7, for both grandma and little boy. He said, two other daughters are not perfect, but they have learned how to love. They have learned how to care and how to, to be patient. Sometimes it's very difficult, he says, but with every day our love grows more and more. It becomes real. He closes his post with a story. He said, just recently I saw a dream. In that dream I went as a pastor to visit a person in the special uh, place where they had handicapped people. And uh, he said, as I entered there, I saw people with all kinds of infirmities, all kinds of different um, health challenges, crippled, handicapped. He says, when I looked at this crowd of people that were broken, crippled, lonely, handicapped, and sometimes they didn't have anything in their eyes that would even communicate anything to me, he said, I did not want to run away from there. I wanted to stay with them. In my heart, he says, there was so much love, patience, and care that, that my whole being was being filled with that kind of love. He says, I, as I was there, as I remained there, I felt that this love was not just filling my heart, but it was filling the whole building. I felt so good as never before. I never experienced before a feeling of joy and happiness as I felt there. I did not want to leave. When I woke up, he says, I thought, that this is how much love will be there in paradise. And that's why it's going to be called paradise. Because that's how much love God will have for all of us. Crippled, wounded, broken people. Are you longing for heaven? It's not about the streets of gold. <laughs> it's not about even the length of life but it's about the presence of Jesus and the presence of God. Because he said, it will be a dwelling place, a tabernacle of God and his people. Are you longing for that place? Are you longing for the place where there will be ultimate acceptance and love? 
Do you know that Jesus has a place just like that for you? Even now, at his feet. You know, Mary, she found a good part. She found a place at Jesus' feet, and Jesus said she found and she chose the best part. And as we grow to be closer friends with Jesus today, he said, don't let your heart be troubled. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would go and prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to be with me in a place of ultimate love. Do you live today in the reality of his second coming? What difference that reality makes in your life today? Perhaps you would like to rededicate your life to Jesus again with me this morning. Say, Jesus, I want to love you more. I want to spend more time at your feet so I can learn more about your love and so that I can love others like you loved me. He prepared a destination for you and me. Don't let anything in this world turn you away from that destination.